Um, so, thank you everybody for joining. Um, we, just for some context, um, we are um, doing these presentations to share a little bit more um, in depth into the organizing theory and some of the concepts um, and models that we use in Cosecha. Um, and so, um, yeah, so that's really what this curriculum is based on, um, so that we're understanding what are uh, lessons from other movements that Cosecha is adopting. Um, and I know that a lot of people who are on this call now weren't part of the first presentation, um, which is, um, which gives a little bit of, well, there's some important context. So what I'm gonna do is do a little bit of an overview um, about the, uh, what we did the very first training. Um, and then I'll jump into this stuff. Does that sound good? Great. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Jay. Um, okay. So, um, sorry. Okay. Um, and I'll put this into present mode. Um, yeah, so just to get started, um, so there's a whole presentation about this, um, but basically what we, um, uh, so basically the, the, the first presentation um, that we did, the first training, talks about how um, in organizing in social movements, um, there are two dominant traditions. Um, so basically there's, um, two different um, like styles or classes of, of organizing. Um, one is what we call structure-based organizing, the structure-based organizing tradition. Um, and the second one is mass protest or mass mobilization. Um, and a lot of the, what we, a lot of the like different disagreements um, that happen between groups actually comes from um, really people having fundamentally different ways of understanding how, how to make change happen. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that you learn, um, we, we learn organizing and we learn the like basically rules for movement building, um, usually in one of those two traditions. And sometimes you don't realize that, um, actually there's more out there, um, than, than what you learned. Um, so the, so I'll just go through this super, super fast because we don't have the whole, we don't have time to do the whole presentation. Um, but basically the first tradition of the, so the structured tradition of organizing um, is, um, and these are two traditions, I should say first, these are two traditions in the United States, but there's similar things that you see in other countries. Um, they have a similar sort of break, break between um, structure-based organizing and between uh, the mass protest or mass mobilization tradition. Um, so structure-based uh, organizing, the basic theory or thinking behind it is um, that there's, um, uh, what you do is you build a base of people, mostly through relationships that you organize into your structure. And the idea is the more people you have, the more powerful your organization becomes, and you can take on bigger and bigger uh, campaigns, bigger and bigger issues um, in order to be able to win. Um, and the way that you win is by basically looking at, um, like, here are the different things that our members care about. Um, what is something that we, if we put enough pressure, if we put enough leverage, um, if we put enough pressure on, on a politician, what is it, what's something that we could win? So for example, um, you might have a campaign um, to, uh, a union might do a campaign um, to be able to win a contract, right, from the, uh, from the company that folks work for. Um, so that's one tradition of organizing. Um, and a lot of the um, union, unions fall under that framework, um, as do a lot of uh, like local based organizations. Um, in the immigrant rights movement, um, there's like most worker centers fall under that tradition. 
um, the uh, faith-based organizing that groups like the Pico National Network do that falls under that tradition, uh, groups like Make the Road that falls under the um, structure-based organizing tradition. Um, so that's one. And then the second is um, the mass protest uh, tradition. Um, and that's really something that um, was um, born in the, um, the, the in, in the United States, at least. Um, it, the, it was really, the model was pioneered by a group called the Central Alliance, which was uh, an anti-nuclear, basically like a nuclear disarmament group. Um, but a lot of the, um, but basically the thinking is that what you do is you do dramatic actions um, and you use mass mobilizations mm -hmm. to change public opinion and change the political weather um, so that you don't start off thinking what's something that we can win, but you think about what's a popular demand, what's something that we could ask for that'll speak to and resonate with the public and try to change the narrative through either big dramatic actions like civil disobediences um, or through mass mobilizations. Um, and uh, so the important takeaway is that um, sometimes we, because we don't understand that there's different ways that people are thinking about how change happens, that have fundamentally different theories, a lot of times we talk past each other um, and we end up getting into fights or we'll be like, you know, maybe the structure based people will be like, oh, you mass protest people aren't strategic. The mass protest people will be like, oh, you structure based people like aren't really there for the community, you know, whatever sort of narratives we tell. But really fundamentally, it's because we have different ways of thinking about how to make change happen. Um, and what we're trying to do in Cosecha, um, and Cosecha is one of many different movements that is experimenting with this, is to figure out how to take the best of both traditions, how to take the best from the structure based tradition um, and how to take the best from the mass protest tradition. Um, so I know that was a lot of information in a really short period of time because there's actually like a whole training for that, but I wanted to give that as context. Are there any questions about that? Or does, does it make sense? Can you let everyone know where we could get um, the first thing yes. is within? Yes, definitely. Um, that is, there's, the training has actually been uploaded, um, so I'll send out the link, um, but if you go to the Movimiento Cosecha YouTube, um, then it's on there. Um, yeah, so here I can actually pull it up right now. Um, Uh, well, actually, I don't want to take time away from this, but so I'll I'll make sure that um, this gets shared with everybody if you're on the call. Um, okay, while that pulls up, um, so we're gonna start. So we're gonna go into. Um, a presentation around building active popular support. Oh, here we go. Uh, okay, so if you go to YouTube and then you go to Movimiento Cosecha's channel, then it'll be there. Um, and I'm also going to send the link out right now um, over the chat. You all should have it in the chat. Um, and then you can also go to Movimiento Cosecha on YouTube, the channel. Um, and then it's called the two dominant, the two dominant traditions. Um, okay, so let's get started then. Um, so we are going to be talking today about how to um, how movements are able to, um, what we call polarize. Um, so how we're able to speak, to reach large numbers of people um, and then bring masses of people to um, participate in the movement. Um, this is loading. Um, and to get started, um, we're actually gonna be talking about 
the two traditions, um, the two different traditions of organizing that I was talking about before. Um, so, and really what it, it's connected to two different ways of thinking about how power operates. So we'll, we'll spend some time first talking about how power operates in our society. Um, so there's two ways of thinking um, about, um, about power. One is what we call the monolithic view of power, um, which basically it says, okay, if we, uh, the people who have power, people at the top decision makers, um, the CEOs of companies, or maybe the president, Congress, um, and if we want to be able to win anything, then what we have to do is we have to put pressure on that person, that decision maker, um, so that they do what we want. And so you always have to think about what leverage do you have? What do you have that they want um, to be able to get them to change their mind, to be able to convince them? Um, so that might be, you know, in the case of a mayor, um, then, you know, mayor cares about getting votes. So if we show that a lot of people really care about our issue, uh, then we can get the mayor to take action. Uh, does that make sense? Pretty straightforward, right? Yep. Um, the second view of power um, is what we call the social view of power, um, which says that basically no, uh, no ruler, no, whether, you know, a dictator or a democratically elected uh, president. Oh, no. My computer is about to start. Um, or, you know, a democratically elected president, but basically you can't rule over people who refuse to be governed over. Um, and that society is made up of um, all of these different, um, what we call pillars. Uh, so basically institutions that allow that the, that allow those rulers to be able to maintain their power. Um, so every system of oppression depends on the cooperation of people who are participating constantly in institutions. So you have the education system, you have law enforcement, um, you have major industries, uh, you have Congress, you know, you have people paying taxes, right? Um, and so, so um, uh, yeah, and that those are the, the pillars um, and the institutions that basically hold up uh, society. But if masses of people stop participating, stop cooperating with those institutions, with those pillars, um, then the person who we think is on top, right, actually loses all of their power. Um, so for everybody who's been to a cosecha training, um, this is basically the theory behind the pyramid activity that we do, right? So it looks kind of familiar. It should look familiar to folks. Um, so, Um, yeah, and so the, according to the social view of power, um, it's really recognizing that um, we oftentimes underestimate how much power we really have. Um, you see this little picture here um, of people protesting this decision maker here, and then, but they, they don't realize that if they all just walked off, then he would fall, right? Um, so it's the metaphor. Um, and uh, yeah, this is, uh, Bill Moyer is a movement theorist um, who studied the way that um, a lot of the different social movements of the 60s were able to work um, and a lot of those models. Um, and he said that the central task of social movements is to win the hearts and minds and support of the majority of the populace because it's the people who ultimately hold the power and they will either preserve the status or create change. Um, Yeah, um, so if we're thinking in terms of the social view of power, um, then the, sorry, the main task of social movements um, is to get enough people who, that are fighting for a certain cause or an issue is to convince people to use their power of mass non-cooperation. Um, so I'll stop there. Any questions about that? All clear? Okay. Um, so yeah, so like I said, if you're thinking in terms of um, a monolithic view of power, 
then what you're going to do is uh, just the kinds of actions that are focused on targeting politicians. Um, and whenever you start a campaign, the first question that you ask, and for folks who have done organizing before, um, this is familiar to you, I'm sure, but you think, um, who's the target? Who's going to be able to get us what we want? And what power do we have over them? Right? That's the conversation. And then you might do actions like uh, showing up at a senate, showing up at a senator's office um, with a bunch of people, or uh, handing in petitions. You might even do like bigger, higher risk actions, like you might do a civil disobedience um, at a politician's office, um, and but your your purpose is to target them and to try to get them to to do something, right? Um, but if we're thinking in terms of the social view of power, um, which is the the way that ma the mass protest tradition uh, works. What you're trying to do is um, change public opinion um, and get enough people to care about the issue and to choose to massively non-cooperate with the system in order, and, and the idea is that if you can get people to do that, then politicians will follow no matter what because they'll have no other choice. Um, which means that for, um, for us in Cosecha, um, because we're uh, in, in Cosecha, we're integ we integrate pieces of the structure tradition and also pieces of the mass protest tradition, but our main theory of change is that if we can get masses of people to, to um, agree to participate, to non-cooperation, um, then that's how we're going to be able to win permanent protection dignity and respect for the elected million, right? Um, and so for us, our target in Cosecha is always the public. Any action that we do, even if we do an action that's at a politician's office, the thinking is always how is this going to move the public to our side how is this going to convince people um, that this issue is important um, and how is it going to inspire them to join the movement to take action um, to use their power of non-cooperation um, and that's a super super important concept um, because that's not the way that uh, people usually think about doing actions. We're so focused on this monolithic view of power that says the people with power, the people on top, um, that the first shift is um, really like a, uh, we have to start changing the way that we think um, and recognize that if masses of people really, it's, it's about really believing in, in people power um, and recognize that if masses of people um, aren't cooperating, that the system falls apart, that it can't function. Um, so, <laughs> that's the idea. Um, and so we're going to, the whole rest of this um, training or presentation really goes into um, how you can use your power of non-cooperation um, and, uh, and, and really diving deep into that concept. So, um, are there any questions first before we continue? About this? Any questions? Straightforward? Okay. Um, we'll just keep moving then. Um, so, Oh, look at that, it's Grand Rapids. <laughs> um, so we're going to talk a little bit about some different, what non-cooperation looks like. Um, so obviously this is familiar to anybody, um, anyone in Cosecha. Um, so in Cosecha we talk right about uh, using boycotts um, and massive strikes, uh, basically using our economic, our power of economic non-cooperation. Um, and the fact that the country depends on the labor of immigrants, um, and that if we choose in massive numbers to non-cooperate, um, then we'll be able to win permanent protection, dignity, and respect. Um, this is a picture of folks in Grand Rapids. Um, I don't think you're in here, Jay, but um, doing the turkey boycott. Um, but there's also other types of non-cooperation. Um, so this is a picture from, um, this happened actually just a couple months ago um, that a number of German pilots um, were uh, so there. So in Germany, they were deporting uh, refugees and asylum seekers. Um, and so the law had already said 
they were they were already set to be deported. They boarded planes, and then in mass numbers, pilots um, refused to fly the planes. Um, so that's another form of non-cooperation, right? Um, so yeah, there are all these different types of non-cooperation. So one question before we continue is why aren't people using that power more? If we're saying that no, um, uh, that, that no government can rule over people who refuse to be ruled over, um, why is it that people aren't resisting more? Any thoughts? What stops people from using their power of non-cooperation? Fear, maybe? Or... Fear, for sure. Other thoughts? Maybe they don't know they have the power, like you said. Mm. Yeah, so a lot of times, our whole like education system, um, the way that uh, the way that we hear um, a lot of these issues talked about in the media, uh, it's, you know, all constantly reinforcing this idea that the people with power are the people on top, right? Um, so, yeah, there are a lot of really good reasons why people don't resist in mass numbers. Um, so some of it has to do with, um, you know, the psychological sh shift that we're talking about with people not feeling self-confidence, not feeling like they can make a difference. Um, a lot of it has to do with fear and there are very real reasons to have fear. Um, there's what we're experiencing now under this administration is very real repression against people who are speaking out and speaking up um, and repression against immigrant rights activists. Um, also people feel hopeless, like a lot of people are like, I'm not gonna do it unless thousands of other people are doing it with me. Um, and, uh, um, and then there's also a set of, uh, there's it, value systems too, right? People are wanting to um, be able to uh, give a better future to their children, um, they're working, um, and we have a whole different set of value systems that, that keeps people participating in the institutions that are able to maintain um, this, uh, this structure. Um, so that's important to recognize first that um, people have very real reasons um, and all of these things are things that we're, we have to fight against um, in the movement. Um, so um, um, but it's also important to recognize that every major um, social reform that's happened throughout history has been when masses of people um, leverage their social power. Um, and oftentimes we think about change happening slowly, um, like incrementally, bit by bit. Um, but there's actually a, um, a movement theorist named Frances Fox Piven. Um, you guys can look her up. Um, but what she actually found was that in the history of uh, social change in the United States in the last hundred years, um, it isn't that change happens incrementally slowly, but actually the, the biggest changes happen really fast all at once um, as like a major wave um, when there are moments of high activity, high movement activity. Um, and a lot of the incremental changes follow um, but that the major changes in our history have been because public opinion, because the political weather is transforming um, through people using their social power. Um, okay. But in order for this to work, of course, we need masses of people. Um, so it's not enough that people agree with us. Uh, they need to actually be participating. They need to be removing themselves, pulling themselves out from the institutions that prop up the system. Um, and um, there's actually a whole field of study uh, called civil resistance studies that tries to understand how is it that people are able to use their social power um, in order to be able to win major social reforms in the United States and in other parts of the world. Um, so we're going to go um, 
a little deep into some civil rights movement history um, to understand a little bit more how this works. Um, so the Birmingham campaign, so who's heard of the Birmingham campaign? Has anyone heard of it? Yes. Yes. Great. Thanks, Jay. Um, do you want to, what, what do you know about the, do you want to share anything you know with the group about Birmingham? Uh, I mean, I've heard of it. I'm just vaguely familiar. But um, are we talking about a voting rights thing or is this something different? Um, yeah, so the Birmingham campaign was one of the uh, major campaigns in the civil rights, uh, during the civil rights movement. Um, that was actually about desegregating businesses okay. in Birmingham. Yeah, so businesses in Birmingham um, weren't hiring uh, black folks and um, also not serving folks. It was segregated. Um, and um, across the South, um, different groups that were part of the civil rights movement, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, uh, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which was Martin Luther King's organization, um, were fighting campaigns to desegregate cities. Um, but what we saw in Birmingham was um, a campaign that created um, it was about the, the, the local campaign of desegregating the city of Birmingham, but actually the purpose of it was to try to, to create um, enough national momentum to create a national story that people across the whole country would be looking at what was happening in Birmingham um, in order to, uh, to completely transform the political weather. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more, uh, a little bit more about it, um, but essentially the um, um, the, the story around Birmingham is um, that the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, so this is Martin Luther King's organization, um, had actually just gotten out of a campaign um, that had failed in Albany, um, not New York, Albany, uh, Georgia. Um, and uh, so they had done, they had essentially, uh, they had run this campaign um, and it didn't create a ton of momentum. Um, and so they basically, at the end of the, the campaign, they sat down um, and to strategize. Um, and basically what they created was a plan um, that they called Project C, and the C stood for confrontation. So what they wanted to do in Birmingham, um, and they picked the city of Birmingham because they knew that Bull Connor, the sheriff there, um, was gonna be using repression um, against people, that he was gonna get violent. Um, and what they thought is that if we create enough confrontation in the city of Birmingham, then this will create a whole crisis across the country that people can't ignore anymore. Um, so the thinking was use this local campaign to actually create a national crisis. Um, and the Birmingham campaign ultimately paved the way for the Civil Rights Act in, of 1964 for federal legislation to pass. Um, so, um, so in Birmingham, so, so the, basically the, and, and what they did with, with the Birmingham campaign um, was they basically put together all of the different tactics um, that they'd been using in order to escalate um, over the last 10 years that they had learned um, and tried to concentrate it and do it, use, use all of those tactics in Birmingham. So um, they did, they started protests knowing, marches knowing that the city would uh, basically make it, make it illegal to assemble. Uh, make it illegal to protest um, and then knowing that if they continue to protest that that masses of people would get sent to jail um, and so what they started doing was um, getting masses of people purposefully getting arrested um, they would do like a meeting in a church they would preach about um, the you know about using uh, nonviolent direct action um, and get people to sign up to basically protest the next day or the day after, at, go through and get arrested. Um, and they were purposefully filling up the jails um, so that there were so many people that actually the jail system wasn't functioning anymore because so many people were getting arrested. Um, they did, this picture here is of the Children's March, um, which uh, basically high school and uh, some like middle school aged kids uh, participated in a march and they knew um, doing this that uh, that the state was going to use massive repression against them 
Um, and so they purposefully created these uh, images for people to, to it, it was really about making visible the brutality that people were experiencing on a day to day basis, but this time doing it in front of cameras for people to see um, and to try to create national outrage across the country. So you have these really iconic images uh, that we still know from the civil rights movement of uh, of children being faced with uh, with really brutal police officers. Um, Mm. So um, yeah, so the so the what they basically did was they took um, a, like a number of months to plan uh, basically a, a six week long campaign, um, and um, within the the a week after they started, basically business got shut down throughout the downtown. Um, and a lot of the business leaders agreed to meet some of the demands um, that the movement was putting. Um, and then over the next three months, 20,000 people across the country participated. So this just inspired massive action, uh, people using similar tactics and copying it in other places. Um, they raised um, a bunch of money for uh, a bunch of bail money. Uh, people were just like wanting to, to give to the movement. Um, about the equivalent of uh, $1.8 million now. Um, and um, yeah, and like I said, the campaign really paved the way um, for the Civil Rights Act of 1964. It made it something that uh, the federal government couldn't ignore anymore uh, because there was like uh, outrage. Oh. Excuse um, me, I'll yeah. still be here. I'm just covering the camera for a bit. <laughs> okay, cool. Yeah, yeah I'm still here. Okay. Um, and um, yeah, and something important to understand um, about the Birmingham campaign um, is that actually when they did it, um, so they, they were asking for some specific things from business leaders in the city of Birmingham. Uh, basically to desegregate uh, the city. Um, and um, they ended up, those those demands were met, um, but a lot of people at the time actually um, complained that the, uh, that the clergy who came together to negotiate on the demands, um, that they actually agreed to take less um, than what they should have. Um, they were asking for more things than what they ended up getting. And a lot of people were saying, um, we're like, you know, you guys are like betraying the movement um, for not trying to get more. But what was what's important to understand about Birmingham is that um, for the leadership of the Birmingham campaign, it was clear that the Birmingham campaign wasn't just about desegregating the city of Birmingham. Um, so it was about Birmingham residents, but it wasn't just about that. What they were trying to do was completely change the weather, um, change the political weather across the whole country. Um, and so they were clear that, um, you know, doing this in a city that had uh, one of the most um, segregated, one of the most racist cities um, with the political leaders um, were like deep segregationists. So they understood that it would be hard to win, uh, to actually win things in Birmingham, but that it wasn't just about that. It was about creating a crisis and creating a confrontation that couldn't be ignored. So they were clear that they were actually targeting the public. Um, and as a result, they were able to change the political weather and they were also able to inspire masses of people across the country to participate in similar actions and use their power of non-cooperation. Um, and uh, just important to understand that the, none of those moments happened by accident. So there were, uh, you know, there are stories about people uh, just watching on TV what was happening um, in Birmingham and deciding to go down and volunteer and join. Um, and all of that was something that was very carefully planned. They wanted to make sure there would be cameras there to inspire other people to take action. Um, and yeah, like I said before, they specifically chose Birmingham knowing that the sheriff, Bill Connor, um, was going to be uh, really reactionary and um, use violence as a form of repression. Um, so <laughs> that's Birmingham. Um, let me pause here uh, just uh, 
if anyone could share um, either a question they have or something they're learning. Actually, it's me again. This is totally random, but what city are you calling from? Oh, um, I'm in I'm in New York right now. Oh, cool. But I've been in Homestead, Florida. Wow. Um, no questions. If not, I can power through and keep going. Okay. Okay. Going once, going twice. Okay, I'll continue. Um, so how do you make something like that happen? Um, so I talked before about the two traditions of organizing. Um, so there's, yeah, well, I'll, through the next, the next pieces of the training series goes deeper into um, all of this stuff. Um, but basically we use um, the cycle of momentum um, to try to integrate some of the best things from the mass protest tradition um, like being able to polarize the public, being able to change public opinion, uh, being able to include, get masses of, activate masses of people, um, and some things from the structure tradition, um, like deep leadership development, like actually having structures um, that can hold and sustain organization um, so that it's not just, uh, you know, one moment, um, like the women's march one moment masses of people are participating and then um afterwards uh there's not a structure to be able to hold in mm. um so that's essentially what we're trying to do is be able to integrate both um and so the cycle um of momentum um let me move this so that folks can see um is you uh do actions to escalate um and create confrontation um, and then from that, you um, are, you bring people into, uh, people who are outside who are looking at what's happening, um, you absorb them, you bring them into your organization, um, and then, um, and train them. Um, and once they're brought in, they can continue to escalate. And then you target the public. Um, so you try to get active popular support, which means, um, masses of people um, who are participating, responding to um, a popular demand, um, like in our case, permanent protection for the 11 million, um, to be able to win. And then you keep going in that cycle. So you escalate, uh, you absorb, bring more people into the movement, have them take action, um, and then uh, you're able to do more and more and more escalation. Um, so easier said than done, um, but that's what we're trying to do in Go um, okay. um, So in this, what we're gonna be talking about is really focusing on when we say active popular support. Um, so the active popular support part of the momentum cycle, um, how is it, well, basically what is that and how are you able to get uh, active popular support from folks? Then there's a whole bunch of trainings on how to do escalations and a whole bunch of trainings on how to absorb people into your structures. Um, so there's a, um, and actually, so I talked before about the field of civil resistance studies. Um, there's actually a sociologist um, named Erica Chenoweth who studied over 300 different um, social movements. Um, and she studied nonviolent campaigns and also violent ones. Um, uh, in different countries, uh, basically all, she tried to find as many different um, political and social movements um, across the world over the last 100 years. Um, and some of these were movements for regime change to get rid of a government or get rid of a dictator. Um, and others were um, to try to win uh, major social reforms. Um, and what she found um, over the last 100 years, studying, analyzing these 300 different movements, um, is that there is not a single movement that failed as long as they had um, active and sustained participation of 3.5% of the population. 
Um, so basically, there are some movements that um, were able to win having less than 3.5% um, of the population actively participating, but there's not a there's not a single movement that had 3.5% uh, or more of the population that failed. Um, essentially, if you've got 3.5% um, of people on the streets using non-cooperation for a sustained period of time, it's impossible for any government to function um, and they have to meet your demands. Now, there's another question that happens, like, you know, if it's the case of a revolution and you're looking for a regime change, actually who what comes next so like uh if you you know for uh folks who were paying attention to what happened in egypt in 2015 um uh there was m masses of people participating there was a revolution they got rid of their dictator Hosni mubarak but then after that there's a whole wave of different failed governments that kept repeating a lot of the you know a lot of the similar a lot of similar uh, violence and oppression and repression that, that people face under Mubarak. So we're not talking about what happens afterwards, but we're just talking about in order to basically force the government to meet your uh, meet what what the people are asking for. Um, what you need is 3.5 percent of the population. Um, and in the United States, that's somewhere around 11 million people, a little bit more than 11 million people. Um, which, of course, for our context is a really significant number. Um, so essentially what this tells us is that um, really we are all that we need <laughs> in order to win. Um, uh, and going back to the initial slide, right, that's why we say it's all about targeting the public, because as long as we're able to get the public to use its power of non-cooperation, we'll be able to win. Um, so our aim is to get mass numbers. Um, so how do we do this? So there, this is um, the spectrum of support, um, which, so basically um, what we have to do in Cosec, um, is really the work of any movements. Um, is, so like I said before, we're always, we're not thinking about targeting politicians. We're always thinking about targeting the public. Um, and what that means is that we have to think about where is the public at on our issue. Um, so there are some people who are, um, in the, the case of immigration, right, there are some people um, who are 100% with us. Uh, there are some people who are neutral, who don't really care that much. And there are some people who are opposition, um, who are the anti-immigrant people, right? Um, and what we want is to bring as many of the neutral people uh, to our side, uh, to be passive supporters, to start to care about the issue. And we want people who are passive supporters to get activated, to become active participants in, uh, in the movement in Cosecha. Um, so, and there's all different types of um, active popular support. Um, but what's essential is that you have as many people as possible who are participating. Um, and it has to be sustained, it has to be visible um, to the public. Um, and so that can look like protest, um, it can look like non-cooperation, um, it can look like donating, it could look like uh, voting if it's done in a coordinated way, um, it can look like starting new organizations. Um, so Cosecha, if we're really successful, um, what we'll see is um, that some people will be inspired to take action um, and they won't necessarily do it through Cosecha, they might start other groups. But that means that the movement is succeeding because what we saw during the, the civil rights movement, for example, is that there were so many different organizations that were starting up um, and working together in like a movement ecology. Um, uh, with, and it's something that, uh, you know, in, in um, uh, 2010 um, that happened, that was happening um, in, as part of the dream movement is that there are organizations starting left and right in every state. Um, so that's the active support piece. Um, and then we also need uh, passive support, um, essentially. Oh, this was something that I didn't mention from the Erica Chenoweth uh, from her studies, but 
so actually what movements need are two things. So one, you need 3.5% of the population actively participating, and you also need a majority, at least 50% um, of the public, basically who agrees with your issue. Um, and the way that you measure um, if you have that um, is basically through public opinion. Um, so you can do it through, um, through polling, um, and, um, but also through news coverage, uh, through how people are talking about stuff on social media. Um, what we see is that um, when movements are winning, the media starts changing the way that they cover the issue. Um, uh, and when we're losing, we also, the media starts changing the way that it, that it talks about the issue. Um, I'll leave it at that for now. Um, so if you look here, um, so this is just looking at public opinion. Um, so um, this was a poll that was done um, asking, so the polling question was uh, the percentage of the country um, that thinks that we need to continue making changes to give Blacks uh, rights equal with, give Blacks equal rights with whites, right? Um, and so here are the polling numbers. Um, so if you look in around end of 2014, 2015, there is a huge uh, increase in basically the number of people, the percentage of, of the public who was saying um, that uh, essentially um, who are recognizing racism as a problem. Um, and so what happened around 2014, 2015, do folks have ideas of why that increased my, why public it could, opinion? It could be, um, shootings by police. Police shootings, right? Um, and police shootings have been happening, uh, for decades, right? Yes. But, um, what happened was that uh, Black Lives Matter, the movement for Black Lives was born and started triggering, started um, basically creating, uh, forcing the public to see that it was happening. So that every time there'd be a shooting, there were massive, massive protests, active popular support, right? Um, so really what we see here is that Black Lives Matter um, massively changed public opinion and polarized the public on the issue um, of police brutality and racism generally. Um, yeah, so in sum, basically, um, in order to win, what, in order to succeed, what movements need, what we need in Cosecha is 3.5% of the population active, uh, activated um, active popular support of 3.5% of the population, so that's around 11 million. Um, and we need uh, the passive support of a majority of the public, so we need 50% um, or more agreeing with our issue, agreeing with permanent protection for the 11 million. Um, and essentially we do that by polarizing. So um, the word uh, so we talk about a lot in Gosech about polarizing the public. Um, so basically polarization forces people um, to pick a side. Um, and it might sound like at first, um, like, I, th I think polarization sometimes has a negative context. People be like, oh, this country is so polarized, right? Um, but for the movement, it's very important. Um, because the worst thing uh, for social movements is to have masses of people uh, who are neutral, who are in the middle, who don't care. And what movements have to do, it's our role to push people to pick a side, to push people to see what's happening um, and basically decide if they're going to stand um, with us or if they're going to stand on the side of injustice. Um, so you want basically to force people to pick uh, between the world as it is and really see it um, and the world as it should be. Um, and all the actions that we're doing um, are really about trying to polarize the public, trying to force the public to see what's happening um, and force the public to pick a side. Um, 
So we're going to talk a little bit about um, some uh, movements um, that have been able to change the political weather through polarization. Um, so this is back to the spectrum of support um, that we talked about. And remember, we're always trying to, in this little fan here, we're always trying to bring people over closer to our side. Um, so if you look at um, the uh, polling that was done around same-sex marriage, um, so around uh, the marriage equality um, over the last 20, 10, 10 years, 20 years, there's been a dramatic change. Um, and it, so if you look back at 1996, um, basically this is where the spectrum of support was. Um, if you look at polls on the issue of gay marriage. Um, so you had basically a, uh, um, you had a pretty big group of people who were neutral. Um, and then you had uh, about a third of the country that were passive supporters or active supporters. Um, and then um, in 2004, there were uh, ballot measures. Um, so people were uh, for marriage protection. So basically ballot measures against same-sex marriage in 13 different states across the country. Um, there are only two U.S. senators who supported, um, who support, who publicly supported same-sex marriage, um, and essentially, um, uh, in 2005, LGBT groups launched um, a strategy to massively transform public opinion um, on the issue of gay marriage um, through campaigns at the state level um, to win marriage equality. Um, but it wasn't, it's what's important to understand is that those campaigns weren't just about winning marriage equality at the state level. It was about transforming public opinion. Um, so this is if you look at 2010, um, was, so it was about half, half, um, active support grew a lot. So a lot more people were participating in the movement. Uh, people were knocking on doors to, uh, support ballot measures for marriage equality. Uh, people were participating in, in massive rallies. Um, and the group of people who were neutral, who were in the middle, shrunk, it grew a lot smaller. So a lot of the new people who had been neutral became passive supporters. Um, from 2012 to 2014, over a dozen states legalized same-sex marriage. Uh, by 2011, 50% of the public is, uh, are passive supporters. Um, and then I don't know if folks remember, but in, in 2012, uh, Biden came out supporting um, gay marriage, closely followed by Obama, um, which was the first that a president had done that. Uh, but what's important to note is that it wasn't that it was because people were putting all kinds of pressure on Obama to come out to say it. It was because public opinion had shifted because there was massive active popular support. And so the politicians followed. Um, and this is where it is in 2017. So basically the numbers are reversed. So even more so, so more than, um, uh, more than two thirds of the country, um, support gay marriage. Um, there's, uh, hardly, there's very few people who are neutral on the issue. There are of course still some passive opponents, um, and a lot of active supporters. Um, and that's a transformation that we've seen over the course of the, a radical transformation on the issue over the last 20 years. Um, so the point here is what movements have to do, like I said before, is making sure that nobody is neutral. You have to force people to make a decision um, and, and show that the right decision is to be on our side. Um, and the way that you do that, one of the ways that you do that um, is also by, by you want to, um, the examples from the civil rights movement, um, they got people to get out of the neutral zone by really showing the violence of segregationists um, and the violence of the police um, in the South um, so that people were forced to pick a side. 
and it couldn't be something that they continue to ignore. Um, but it's also really important to understand that when movements grow, the opposition tends to get stronger. Um, so there's going to be a period um, as your movement, uh, which happened if, if we look at the same sex marriage uh, example. Um, but it, as, as our movements grow, as we bring this issue, make this a central issue that everybody is talking about, um, what's going to happen is also that anti immigrants, that our opposition is going to grow as well and become more active. Um, and I don't know if some people might remember, um, do folks remember, does anyone remember the Minutemen? Who those were? Does anyone know what the Minutemen were? Are you talking about the, during the Revolutionary War or the ones that were like related to militia? Yeah, the militia guys. So, oh, okay. yeah, so basically yeah. Um, in uh, like 2000, starting in 2008, 2009, um, what uh, there, um, basically a bunch of like crazy anti-immigrant people started going to the Southern border uh, being in places I like remember. Arizona and like they would set up camp there um, and basically they were saying since nobody since we don't have control over our borders um, and since there's no wall uh, we're going to protect this country and so they would would be there with guns basically uh, ready to shoot people coming uh, who are crossing the border um, and um, a lot of those types of groups grew um, and really what that was about was that was a response to the massive, the mega marches in 2006. So the massive mega marches in, in 2006 for immigrant rights um, changed public opinion on the issue of immigration. Um, and there was so much active popular support um, and the movement had hit a point where, uh, um, where things were transforming. Um, and the Minutemen was really a reaction to that. Um, which is something natural that happens. Um, but what's key is making sure that you're getting more active popular supporters than the opposition is, that you're pulling more people to your side. Um, and what, uh, what movements do, uh, um, what the civil rights movement did really successfully is also as your opposition grows, um, show to the public that they're crazy, that they're marginal, um, um, and, you know, there are a lot of images from the civil rights movement um, of uh, um, crazy white supremacist segregationists in the South um, being violent. And those were a lot of the images that also um, brought the neutral people, polarized the neutral people to be active supporters. Um, does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, go for it. Um, Let's pause for questions. This is a good moment. How do we, I guess, like try to make sure that these like people who are going to have the polar opposite views aren't taking actions that are putting our community at risk and maybe potentially risks that our community wasn't willing or isn't willing to take? I don't know. Yeah. Like, are we going to plan for those situations? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. Um, so there's a whole- Could you repeat the question? Yeah. Um, so the, do you want to repeat it? I think I'm okay. I'm not in public space and there's a lot okay. of noise, so maybe that's like- Cool. Okay. Yeah, I'll repeat it. So the question was, oh. um, if there, if we're anticipating, that the opposition um, is going to get stronger um, and that might mean that people um, will get violent or also that uh, it, it could be from like state repression as well. Um, basically, how do how can we protect our communities uh, knowing that that's going to happen? That was the question, right? Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's a really, really, really important question. Um, and I don't think there's an easy answer to it, um, but um, 
so there's a whole there's a whole training um, around um, around escalation and all of this stuff, um, which which is actually different a uh, different module than this. But um, the principle in cosecha that we talk about is um, uh, that um, you don't ever push people to take risk and take sacrifice. Um, but that also it's everybody else's support when somebody wants to take risk and sacrifice that it's other people's role to support them. Um, so what we're talking about in, um, you know, with the stuff around active popular support, right, is that uh, we need millions of people to be participating. Um, we need masses to be participating. And um, that means that there need to be ways that people can be involved that are going to be uh, safe where there's, they're not going to be met with violence um, or, uh, you know, masses of people aren't going to be, um, at least at this point, um, aren't going to be doing civil disobediences, but they would want to come to a march, right? So you, we need to have ways, um, spaces for people to be able to participate in the movement that are safe. Um, but um, on the other hand, all of this stuff around polarization that I'm talking about, um, it also is important that there be people who are taking higher risk and higher sacrifice um, because that's um, that escalation is what pushes people, what inspires people to take action, uh, what gets more of the public to participate, um, and what also changes public opinion. Um, and uh, so what our role is as much as possible um, is to try to make sure that uh, that um, people are clear on what are the risks that they're taking and that they can make a choice about do they want to do it or not. Uh, and knowing that some people will make that choice and other people, the majority of people won't. Um, uh, so that's, that's one thing. Um, and um, yeah, I think we, you know, there's, it, it's, it's a little bit, I mean, there definitely there are situations in which um, uh, you know, things could happen or get violent that you didn't anticipate. Um, one thing that's super, uh, super important is as Bosecha grows to make sure that people have training on how to hold, how to maintain nonviolent discipline. Um, because that's what, you know, what we say in Cosecha is that nonviolence is our shield. Um, that, that making sure that um, we're not escalating um, is what will protect our movement. Um, and protect people in the movement, um, but for sure that's not a that's not a hundred percent. So yeah, definitely there's a there's a piece around everybody being trained um, to make sure that uh, we know how to de-escalate situations. So if somebody is getting violent, we know how to handle that. Um, uh, but yeah, in general, I would say um, it's really about us being clear and like if if uh, uh, as a circle um, or as a community, if we're clear, um, this is an action where there might be um, a violent response um, that people are prepared, know that going in and are making that choice um, or are given the option to not make that choice. Um, and that we also have uh, rallies and marches happening for people who are participating for the first time who um, uh, for people to be able to bring their kids and their grandmas, right? Um, uh, and just us being really clear in making the distinction between the two. Um, does that make sense? It does, thank you. Yeah, and I think there's like the, there's to some extent it's, uh, you know, we, we do things, we can do things to try to protect people. So when we do marches, it's like have marshals um, and that kind of thing. Um, you know, make sure that people are, are being trained on uh, how to de-escalate, that kind of thing. Um, but I also think most of the times when um, uh, we see like violent uh, response, either from police um, or from um, like crazy anti-immigrants, um, it's a situation where we know that getting into it, that that's, that's what's going to happen. Um, that was certainly true for the civil rights movement, um, was that they were clear, the, the March on Washington, for example, uh, was something that, um, you know, was something for masses of people to be able to participate in, knowing that there wasn't going to be 
violent repression, but a lot of the actions that uh, they did throughout the civil rights movement, um, they did, pe people who did them, who participated in them, uh, participated in them knowing that there would be, uh, that they would be met with violence and, and um, um, yeah. Um, so, so most of the time you can, um, you can anticipate and you can plan for it um, and give people that choice. But the important thing is we know we need people to be taking risk and sacrifice in order for our movement to be able to grow. In order to get, the, in order to get uh, passive supporters uh, to take action, to be active, we need some people who are taking higher levels of risk. Uh, that's part of the purpose of escalation is to target the public to get them to join. Um, and so for folks who don't want to take that risk and sacrifice, um, it's about how do we make sure that we're supporting the people who are. Um, Use your cat. Um, okay, so sorry about that. Um, okay, so any other questions before we continue? Um, okay, we'll keep going. Um, so these are, this is an example um, for folks who remember uh, Sanctuary Campus um, and how it happened. Um, so this was an example of us using the momentum cycle to get uh, masses of people uh, to um, participate in uh, high school and college walkouts um, right after Trump took office. Um, so um, basically, I remember what happened was right after uh, right after Trump took office, um, we saw that a few high schools, uh, high school students. In a few high schools in Phoenix, Arizona, um, were walking out um, to protest Trump's selection. Um, and uh, we also saw that there were a lot of people, uh, basically a lot of active supporters, a lot of people who, uh, or a lot of passive supporters, a lot of people who, a lot of students who were really angry about Trump having won, um, who wanted to be able to do something and wanted to be able to take action. Um, so what we did was we just got people on a call it was a Zoom call, um, and I think the limit is like 50, you can only have like 50 people on a Zoom call or something like that. And the first 50 joined, and then there were like, you know, dozens and dozens of other people who were trying to get on the call. Um, and basically what we talked about was um, doing a day of coordinated walkouts across the country in high schools and colleges, um, calling for campuses to be um, sanctuaries. Um, and something important to understand about Sanctuary Campus is that in, in many ways it was like a symbolic demand um, that, uh, you know, we uh, knew that the, uh, that, um, uh, you know, there are some things that administrations could do to be able to protect students. Um, but for the most part, um, what it was about was to be able to try to shift public opinion on the issue of immigration and to get um, active popular support to get lots of people participating. Um, uh, yeah, so the, so the demand for the most part was something symbolic in order to get people to take action to be able to build uh, for permanent protection uh, for the 11 million, um, which was ultimately what it, what it was about and what we we're trying to polarize the public towards. Um, so there were like 180 campuses. Uh, we created a, a toolkit, basically like an easy, here's how you do a walkout. Um, and here are the demands. Here's like a press release that you can send out. We set people up with coaches um, so that uh, students who wanted to do a walkout could uh, have somebody to like help talk them through it. Um, and we had uh, like 180 campuses um, and high schools the country participate. People were just like signing up like crazy to participate in, in Sanctuary Campus. Um, uh, and then some of those folks then later got trained, came to the National Assembly, became part of Kosecha. So going back to the uh, momentum cycle that, that I showed you guys before, um, it was about walkouts to escalate, uh, to be able to then get active popular support. So 
um, thousands and thousands of students participating um, and shaping public opinion, um, and then uh, absorption bringing them into our structure. Um, this uh, was an example of um, using um, uh, escalation to polarize the public, uh, to shape public opinion. Um, so uh, for, and I'm sure a lot of you remember this, but um, the day that Trump um, took away DACA, um, that morning we had a civil disobedience in front of Trump Tower um, where uh, people including DACA recipients participated and got arrested in a civil disobedience, basically blocking the street in front of Trump Tower. Um, and especially because of the time that we did it, um, it meant that across the country, what people were seeing when it happened was images of people, especially DACA recipients, getting arrested and that their, their words and what they were saying was what the public was hearing. Um, so uh, that action was all about polarizing the public and trying to get people um, uh, to support uh, permanent protection for the 11 million and hear uh, the message of what they check. Um, so in some ways, the sanctuary campus before this example was about how to get active popular support. Um, and then this example is polarizing uh, the public to try to win over people, people who are neutral um, and, um, and shape public opinion. Um, so going back, so that was about uh, escalation. Um, and then from that action that we did, we were able to absorb people. There was the undocu gathering, um, and people joined circles and joined uh, joined uh, the movement. Um, and then the next step after that is you do things like sanctuary campus, uh, things like the May first campaign uh, to get large numbers of people participating. Um, and then of those people, some people will will continue to escalate. Um, you absorb from people who are watching it and then uh, continue doing things and, and that's how it goes, basically. Any questions about that? About any of this? Questions? Okay, if there are no questions, um, then let's do a go around. Um, and if everybody could share something that uh, you uh, are learning from this, something that's been helpful. Could you say that again, what we're yeah, sharing? Yeah. Um, something, something that you're learning, just something you've learned, something you're learning. Oh, um, well, I learned about the uh, Birmingham <laughs> campaign a little more, so that was good, definitely. Great, thank you, Jay. I learned about how uh, the history of these different um, political theories were formed um, and how we can use those past um, events and um, the instances where they were implemented to help us further plan and make our movements more effective today. Thank you, Stephanie. Other learnings? Yeah, it's Carlos. Um, yeah, I always learn a lot. I, I think what I appreciate the most um, is the theorists and concepts behind the two types of organizing. But also, it's nice to see the numbers by Erica Chinowitz mm -hmm. uh, and seeing how uh, how much of a small percentage is needed to actually succeed with regards to active support. Uh, yeah, I'm a big believer in the spectrum of support. And, you know, I'm constantly working on how do we, you know, make folks from uh, inactive supporters to, oh, passive supporters to active supporters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I've learned plenty. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. What, um, I, uh, sorry, I, um, 
I like that coming to terms with the idea that our political leaders aren't really like sort of our make or break in deciding the fate of like our community. Um, and I think sometimes it's hard for me to like believe that, like truly believe it. But it's nice to see how how these other movements have proven that. Thanks, Julia. And just a um, a note on that um, that I think is important um, is so when I talked in the beginning about the monolithic view of power versus the social view of power, um, there are definitely things that can be won monolithically, um, meaning that uh, there are things that you can you can look at the political situation as it is and say. Uh, you know what, our organization um, has enough leverage. Um, we have enough power over this politician um, that uh, we, um, we, can use, uh, we can use our leverage to be able to get them to agree to something. Um, so I think if, if we're thinking about, um, well, for example, DACA, um, it's a little complicated because it's, it's DACA was a mix of both. It was the, the dream movement um, was in 2010, um, was able to polarize the public. So they massively changed public opinion, um, which people for the, you know, the way that people talk about it now, they forget about it. They act like, uh, you know, the American public always cared so much about dreamers, right? Uh, but really what it was, was um, the, the dream movement in 2010, um, even though the dream act failed, um, the movement was successful in terms of getting the broader American public uh, to support the issue, right? Um, so uh, yeah, so they were able to shift, uh, the, the 2010 dream movement was able to massively shift public opinion, um, using more, thinking more in terms of the social view of power um, but really it was uh, putting pressure on Obama um, during an election year in 2012 when he needed the Latino vote um, and doing, you know, the folks who did civil disobedience in his campaign office um, that DACA was won. Um, and that, uh, yeah, and, and so that's thinking in terms of monolithic view of power because it's like, what is it that Obama cares about? Obama cares about the Latino vote. How do we use that? we can try to, uh, uh, we can do actions to show that Obama is deporting people to try to make him look bad so that he gets, he's forced to give us what, he, what we want. Um, but what we're saying in Cosecha is that we've reached a point basically where we can't actually win uh, what the, the very least that our community deserves, uh, which is permanent protection um, using the strategies of targeting politicians um, so like in the, um, in 2013 um, and 2014, where, when people were pushing for comprehensive immigration reform, um, folks might remember, but there were like all of these actions to try to push, put pressure on individual senators. Um, and I remember uh, people were organizing a lot in Republican districts, um, especially Republican districts that had an immigrant uh, you know, that had a big immigrant community uh, to try to pressure those Republicans um, to change their position on immigration. Um, and people tried really, really hard and it just didn't work. Um, the, we just weren't at it. It, it was clear um, that uh, basically immigration reform is not something that we can win by just putting pressure on politicians, that what needs to happen is massive, a massive change in the political weather um, a massive change in public opinion um, on the issue of immigration and we need masses of people who are actively on the streets um, in order to be able to change anything. Um, so yeah, but I think that what, what I just wanted to highlight was um, it's, it's not to say that the monolithic view of power that thinking about what leverage do you have over a politician that that's never a good strategy. It's just understanding when uh, you're fighting for something that you can win that way and when you're not. And when you're not, then we have all of these other tools uh, from the field of civil resistance, from the mass protest tradition, uh, to be able to change public opinion. Um, uh, and, and really that's where the idea of Cosecha was, uh, was born, 
was seeing that we couldn't keep fighting the same way anymore, uh, but we had to do something really different um, in order to change to uh, to basically change the political weather. And what that looks like is targeting the public, focusing on uh, changing public opinion and focusing on getting uh, uh, getting people to really recognize the power of non cooperation um, that we have. Um, any other learnings? Thank you for that last one. It reminded me of <laughs> to clarify that. Um, I guess the, another thing that I would share, um, well, actually two things. Um, so if we're looking back at this spectrum of support, um, it's really important for every action that we do because you can't target everybody at the same time. Um, so it's really important when we think about what are the actions that we're going to do to be super clear in our heads about who is it that we're targeting um, and how is it that we're trying to move them. Um, so for example, it's uh, an action um, that's focused on, um, for example, uh, getting um, like progressive white people who don't really know much about the issue of immigration, but getting them out of the place where they're neutral to where they're passive supporters to where they're talking about the issue and whether they care about it. An action that does that's going to look really different than an action that's maybe focused on trying to activate uh, uh, people who, uh, who are passive supporters because maybe their family is undocumented, but they've never been involved. They've never been active participants in the movement before. Um, and uh, an action, for example, that's um, targeted towards trying to get young people uh, to become activated is really different than an action that's uh, focused on trying to get older folks, trying to get uh, parents or workers um, activated. Um, and so it's really important in every action that we do to think about what's our message, who are we trying to talk to, and what is, what is it that we're, where are we trying to move them on the spectrum of support? Are they a neutral that we're trying to change their view? Um, or are they a passive supporter that we're trying to activate um, and inspire them to take action? Um, uh, so part of the strategic thinking that we have to do is to constantly be thinking in those terms um, and to also know that we can't target everybody at once because different people are going to respond to different messages. Um, so we have to really think about what's the group of people that we're speaking to with this action and with this campaign. Um, and I also wanted to just share, because we've been talking a lot about the civil rights movement, um, so a lot of the actions that um, that uh, people did in the earlier stages of the civil rights movement um, were um, really the actions were focused on trying to get um, uh, it was like uh, you know students doing actions young people doing actions to try to get um older middle class black folks living in the south uh to become a part of the movement because you know they were of course passive supporters um but they weren't they hadn't been activated and so um the lunch counter sit-ins for example um that folks did and a lot of the tactics of the birmingham campaign um it wasn't just about trying to move people out of the neutral um and try to change public opinion of white people uh but a lot of it was initially um, had to do with trying to move, um, especially uh, older and middle class um, black folks from passive supporters into active supporters. Um, any other questions or uh, a learning?
going once, going twice, don't be shy. Um, okay, maybe I'll also just add one thing, um, which is that um, you can do, um, even within the context of Gothecha, uh, for example, in New Jersey, folks are working on a driver's licenses campaign right now. Um, so some of the conversation that we had earlier on about the licenses campaign, um, you can do a campaign that is uh, thinking about trying to win something from a politician. Um, so Phil Murphy, for example, governor of New Jersey, we want him to do, to, uh, to pass licenses. Um, so you can think about targeting him, um, which is uh, more of a monolithic view of power, theory of change. Um, but what's important is that when we're doing campaigns in Cosecha, that everybody, especially leadership, um, but as many people as possible, everybody who's coming into circle meetings, who's getting trained, understands that the reason that we're doing campaigns um, and the reason we might do an action on a politician is about a much bigger strategy that ultimately what we're trying to do is shift public opinion and activate, uh, and activate people. And that if you, for example, if we do a licenses campaign in New Jersey, um, and win licenses, but it's through a negotiation that nobody sees, uh, like behind closed doors with Bill Murphy, um, and we didn't change public opinion at all, and we don't have more, more people who have joined the movement who have become active supporters, um, then we might have won licenses, but we're not actually, um, uh, the, the, the bigger goal uh, that looks beyond just this campaign, um, we're, uh, we're not reaching that, right? Um, so just being really clear that when we're doing local campaigns, it's okay to be uh, doing an action or targeting a politician, but we have to understand that the purpose of everything that we do, of all of the actions that we're doing, um, it's not about that politician. Um, it's about trying to activate the public. And that really starts to change the way that you think about doing actions. Because if you're thinking in terms of how are we gonna move this politician, um, then you might think um, like, okay, well, we'll do a bunch of little actions first, we'll send some petitions to him, and then we'll start to escalate. Then the last thing that we'll do is like a major protest, um, or the last thing that we would do is a civil disobedience, right? But if you're thinking that everything that you're doing is about shifting public opinion, and everything that you're doing is about trying to get uh, people who are passive supporters activated, um, then, um, then you start out doing actions right away, right? Because actions is how you're gonna polarize the public. Um, actions is how you're gonna activate people and inspire them. Um, you don't wanna just do that at the very end, you need to do that from the beginning. Um, so that shift in thinking just completely transforms um, everything that we do, even if uh, we're doing a campaign like a licenses campaign um, that uh, where, you know, there is something that we're trying to get out of a politician. Does that make sense? So it's like we can have a secondary uh, theory of change that's around um, trying to win something from a politician. Um, but it, what's important is that we never lose sight of the fact that our primary theory of change is that if we are able to activate 3.5% of the population, and if we're able to polarize the public to our side, that's how we're able, that's how we're gonna win. Um, and everything that we're doing, every single campaign that we do, every action we do, we have to think about how are we building towards that. I have, I guess you could call it a learning, just a comment. Um, I like how you presented this. And actually it's, it's very simple, but yet there are some complex topics or ideas in there. So I think it was good how you did that. So thanks, Jay. Yeah. Appreciate it. Um, yeah. Um, so I hope that's helpful. Um, uh, there's another thought <laughs> that occurred to me also um, that I just wanted to lift up. Um, that it's also really important for us um, to train as many people as possible. 
um, in our circles in this theory of change that we want to start measuring our success, not in terms of what are we getting, but measuring our success in terms of are we changing public opinion, are we changing the narrative and the story, and are we activating more people to our side. Um, and for sure, that's always going to be, you know, like we're not, we're not going to be able to train everybody in that. Uh, but we want as many people in Cosecha um, and as many people who are coming to our meetings and to our actions to understand that that's how we're thinking about how we're going to win is about targeting the public. Um, and um, that'll also start to, you know, if you, um, I think just getting, getting clarity on that, how that, that, that's how we're defining victory um, in our movement, because that's what's going to bring us closer uh, to winning permanent protection for the 11 million. Um, but yeah, it's, it's our responsibility to be training people on that. Um, and that'll also give us a lot more clarity um, in when we're deciding what, what are the kinds of actions that we want to do. Um, and then also when we're going back and we're debriefing and thinking about our campaigns and was this successful or not. Um, so if you think about like the, uh, you know, the example of the dream movement in 2010, um, a lot of uh, the, when the, uh, so the movement was able to bring uh, the Dream Act to a vote, um, even though the, the Democrats didn't want to vote on it. Um, and in the end, it failed um, in the Senate um, uh, in December of 2010. Um, and a lot of people experience that um, as uh, a loss. And obviously, you know, um, it was the campaign was about getting uh, that piece of legislation passed, so it makes sense. Um, but uh, if you can take a step back, it's also seeing that that uh, the Dream Movement was hugely successful in terms of changing public opinion. Um, and in terms of activating uh, people in the movement um, so that all of a sudden you had masses of groups that were popping up all over the country. Um, uh, people who were self-organizing, um, really a movement was born. Um, and um, it was that that was able to pave the way uh, for DACA in 2012. And that's the reason that if you look at public opinion now of like, like Trump supporters all like all support dreamers. That was really the victory of the dream movement. Um, and you know, there you can have debates around, um, uh, you know, what was the impact of a lot of people being excluded from the dreamer narrative. Um, but, um, but definitely in terms of uh, these two metrics of shifting public opinion um, and of activating, uh, activating the public, uh, the dream movement was hugely successful. Hmm. But now we need to do that for the 11 million. Oh. Okay. Well, um, I'll just give folks a second uh, if people want to ask a last question. Going once, going twice. Oh, I have one. Oh, okay. yeah, go for it, Jay. So, are you doing another presentation next week? Yeah, so this is part of a training series. Um, so you can look at the old presentations on, they're on the YouTube, Movimiento Musical Social YouTube channel. So we'll upload this one. Um, and then next week we're gonna be talking, um, I believe it's really going in depth into the escalation piece of the cycle. Um, so like all of this stuff builds on each other um, and it's like all a bunch of different conceptual tools that are important to, to understand the whole picture, but also we're trying to do it so that, um, there's stuff in, in, in each one that you can use, um, like on its own. So oh, yeah, but next YouTube, Sunday, I should have, I should have worn a better shirt. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, but next Sunday is, uh, next Sunday there will be, uh, part three of this same series. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, and it's the same time and the same Zoom number. Um, next week, I think I'll be doing it bilingually. Is it uh, by the phone? No, next week I'll be doing it in English and in Spanish. Oh, oh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, great. Okay.
well thank you everybody for joining um i hope everyone has a good night and um feel free yeah uh the i has everybody here seen the facebook event that um i'm just thinking in terms of like how folks can ask questions if you have them um was it the one for this yeah the one for this uh does briefly. everyone have that? I saw it briefly. Okay. Um, well, there's basically the, yeah, it's the Facebook event that has this training series. Um, so you can also ask questions on there. Um, and then, yeah, all of this, will, the PowerPoint also will make sure to send that around. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Great. Thank you, everybody. Good. Have a good night. Thank you, Vera. Yeah, you. for sure. How do, uh, oh, how do I turn this off? Actually, <laughs> that's my question. Oh, you just—I'm going to end the meeting, so it'll—it'll it'll turn off. Oh, okay. Thanks. Yeah. yeah.